the parents of the class of 1973. That may sound like a long time away, but we want you and your son or daughter to start thinking about that goal immediately, graduation, June 1973. We hope that you feel welcome and that by the time you leave, you will feel comfortable about leaving your son or daughter at Augsburg. We appreciate the opportunity of meeting separately with you and hope that many of your questions will be answered by the time you leave. After our first session here in Melby Hall, we'll divide up into smaller groups. There's a lot of echo, isn't there? Somebody's up in the crow's nest and will correct it quickly, we hope. After the first session in Melby Hall, We'll break up into smaller groups, and that will give you a chance to raise some of the questions that might be on your minds. Then we'll have a chance to eat supper together and then finish the evening off with uh, an address by President Anderson. I'm convinced, and most of us at Augsburg share these same convictions, that one of the most important things that a college can offer its new students is support through, counseling, through a counseling program. At Augsburg, we think of our counseling program in a broad sense. We don't think that counseling should be restricted to those students who are having what might be called a severe emotional problem. But on the other hand, we want each student to think seriously about who he is and, in other words, develop an inventory about his strengths and his weaknesses, his hopes and his aspirations. This year at Augsburg, we are expanding and reorganizing our counseling services by establishing a center for student development. The director of the center will be Dr. Thomas Homan. Dr. Homan is a graduate of the University of Wisconsin and has attended Luther Theological Seminary. He received his doctor's degree in clinical psychology from the University of Minnesota. At this time, it's a distinct pleasure for me to present to the parents of the class of 1973, Dr. Thomas Homan, who will address you on the topic between parent and student. Dr. Homan. I had that strange feeling just now. I have one speech in my right hand that says between parents and students and the one in my left pocket that says to students. And I thought, what would happen if I reached in and pulled the one out for students and gave it to the parents, and the one for parents and gave it to the students? And I almost tried the experiment, but I will stick with the one that is to address parents. It's my task, and I've done this for a couple of years running now, to discuss with you as parents and parents of entering freshmen some thoughts about the role of the student and the role of the parent in his relationship to the student. As I go along developing this thing and trying to update it in my own thoughts, I become more and more aware of my own position in relationship to parents and students. The further I go, the more, in a sense, I realize that I'm an outsider looking in, sometimes looking very personally at the lives of individual students, sometimes looking at it in terms of research and some of the concepts that are developing in higher education. But I thought that I would at least say that my basic frame of reference is that of a human being or another one just like you as parents. Secondly, I suppose I look upon things as a psychologist. I've been trained as one, and I can't get rid of it whether I'd want to or not. Lastly, I suppose I look at students and parents with what I would say very positive attitudes towards man and his adaptability and his role 
in the continuing development of the world. I say this because I want you to know the frame of reference from which I speak. I'd like to talk with you this afternoon about several different things. First of all, something that I will call development and the tasks that face your children as college students. Secondly, some specific influences from the culture around him, the student culture. Thirdly, some impressions of adolescence. Fourth, some impressions of parents. And lastly, a little bit on a concept called identity. So let me first of all delineate some tasks that I think your students face as they now enter Oxford College as freshmen. Basic to the concept of development, and here I'm talking about what happens as people grow through their lives, not just physically, but psychologically, emotionally, academically, and so on. But basic to the concept of development is what I would call the student's task. Children go through, from the day they are born, certain stages of growth during which they face these tasks. And it's a well-known fact in developmental psychology that they must face these tasks. They must, in a sense, conquer them and master these tasks if they're going to go on for the rest of their lives in an orderly fashion. For example, a common task that you will see all small children doing is learning to walk or talk going to school and learning to do math or become an academic being. It is my belief that all people, including ourselves, continue to grow and develop through various stages right up to the time of our death. As far as the student is concerned, there is, I feel, a very specific task or set of tasks which he has to accomplish during the years of college. And I have separated out the college years as a distinct period in the growth and development of the human being. Here at Augsburg and all other colleges, the student comes in as an adolescent. And interestingly enough, if you teach a course in adolescent psychology, most frequently, the student defines himself yet as an adolescent. But he's going to leave here as an adult. And he's going to have to be prepared for the adult world. Let me delineate for you and make comment on several tasks that I believe are most pertinent to the college experience. Initially, it's today and it's the adjustment to college. It's moving into the dormitory. It's meeting new friends. It's going through the beanie wearing and the hazing. It's learning when meals are served, how to go to class, who your professors are. And in one sense, it's really a miniature world all of its own. In this initial adjustment, and it's probably the most crucial part. It's a time to experiment, to learn how to live with others, and a time to be or to learn to be responsible for oneself. Secondly, and you people are experiencing this today with at least one individual in your family, it is the beginning, and a rather abrupt beginning, in the separation or growth away from one's role as a child in the family. For some students, this growth away from the family is very hard. And for others, 
it is easy or maybe even welcome. And I think the same goes for parents. For some it is very hard, for some it is very easy, and for some of you, you can wipe the sweat off your brow and breathe a sigh of relief. In either case, be it parent or student, there are a lot of feelings about this movement away from the family that must be resolved for the student and the parents during the time of his college experience. A couple of years ago, one of our professors was commenting on this after meeting with his freshman. He said, you can never go home the same, nor will home ever be the same again once the college experience starts. And I think that's a very vital fact to keep in mind. Third, there is a very important type of social task that the college student must encounter. And that is literally to become a social being. To have to relate to people in general, to relate to people of the opposite sex in terms of dating, marriage, and one's own sexuality. And here I feel that the student must learn in a most concerned manner. Because half of what he's going to do in his life will be his involvement with others in various social tasks. Fourthly, and I think this is particularly true here at a Christian liberal arts college, is the task of setting up one's own mature, and I stress mature, religious beliefs. As most of you know, old ideas are always being challenged. And this is particularly true in the Christian Liberal Arts College in the religion courses. And I would have to say that for most part, the Christian Liberal Arts College is in the forefront of challenging the students' traditions. Out of this particular area, new concepts are in order. And I would say that some of your children may change the most drastically here. You're going to confront new ideas, new beliefs, new experiences, new forms of worship, new enthusiasm about religion. And it is one of those tasks in our culture that I think is most vital. Lastly, and I'm not in making an all-inclusive list of tasks here, but last on my list for discussion is the problem of vocation. What does a student do about choosing a way of life in terms of work? While he is at college, I think this is a major part of his dilemma. And I would say this, that your students don't realize how close they are to the world of jobs. It's very easy in a liberal arts college such as Augsburg to say, well, don't worry about it. We're here for a liberal arts education. But there's the reality coming in four years that they are going to have to select some kind of job, some kind of position, some kind of occupation for a good share of their life. And it's a very important thing to be straight on. It's my feeling that as students come to college, they have a relatively restricted knowledge as to what's available. If you look around your communities in terms of college-educated people, they're familiar with doctors, lawyers, ministers, teachers, maybe a nurse or two, some people of this nature. But if you then confronted the student with the Dictionary of Occupational Titles and showed them that there are 42,000 jobs described and said, go ahead and make a wise choice, it's rather difficult. I think there's the urge amongst students about this business of vocation and very frequently 
pushed by parents to leap into something right at the onset and relieve one's anxiety. I would just point out a couple of statistics to you. In one study on changes of vocational goals or occupational goals in college, they found that 60% of the students who had entered as freshmen and graduated as seniors changed their major at least once. And 24% in the same study changed their major at least twice while they were in college. So if Johnny or Mary come home and say, this week I'm an art major, and the next month they're a chemistry major, and the following month they're a sociology major, don't get too upset. They're in the process of experimenting, of looking, of finding new things, and sooner or later they're going to find a spot. Let me next turn to something that I would like to call cultural influences. And these affect the student, whether he is aware of them or not at present. First of all, if you look at our culture, and you look at education, and you look at the goals of your students, you will see that they are being forced into longer and longer periods of dependence in order to attain educational goals. They're economically dependent, most frequently on you. They're socially dependent on their peers. And they're educationally dependent on the college or wherever they are going for their professional training. And as I say, it's getting longer and longer to learn the proper tasks to be able to cope with our world. Secondly, if you look at our world around us, you and I know, and I think they're rapidly going to know, just how fast the change and the pace of change in the world is occurring. And I think that I would make this insight into us as adults, that sometimes if, as we look around us and see what's happening, we at least appear to be as confused about it as anyone. We are just as upset. We are just as anxious. We are just as frightened, in a sense, of what's happening. And I think this affects the student, both in his contacts with you and his contacts with his society. He knows how fast it's moving. He knows that he can be left behind very quickly. He knows, in a sense, that he can graduate from college and be obsolete as far as his training. I might mention this to you as an anecdote from my own graduate training. When I entered the University of Minnesota, we were told by the director of our program that we were now in a brand new program that would produce the finest clinical psychologists that Minnesota could. At the end of my third year, as I was preparing to do my dissertation work, the university psychology department announced a whole new program for training clinical psychologists and said that it would prepare the finest set of clinical psychologists available, and anything beyond that would be obsolete. So I felt by the time the end of the fourth year came, technically, according to my department, I was obsolete. And I think this is a distinct possibility with the change, technically at least, the speed of change that is taking place. Another influence that you probably are increasingly aware of, at least as it is referred to in newspapers and magazines, is the so-called generation gap. And here, I suppose, the problem centers most frequently in terms of conflict with home. What is the student learning? What does he believe? 
How are his actions? How do you take them? How do you react to what he is doing? How do you account for the fact that he's better educated than you are, even if he has the same amount of education? How do you communicate across this so-called gap? And it seems as we again move more rapidly that for some people at least the gap gets larger and larger. A fourth influence, and one that I think we're acutely aware of these days, is the obligation, and I might call it threat, of military service. What does the student do with this obligation? How does he handle his conscience and his convictions? What does he do when he looks at him, himself in terms of Vietnam? What kind of support does he have from his peers or his parents or his teachers? And this not only affects the male student, it affects the woman student who may be close to a male student or who may be affected by a person in the group. And if you could have sat in my office last week and listened to the rather, what I thought, pathetic sobs of a student whose very close friend had been killed in Vietnam a week before, I think you can get some of this feeling. A fifth influence, and I think this is very true of the college student, is what I would call the conflict between ideals and reality. College is an idealistic situation. In a sense, it is a miniature world, as I mentioned earlier. In some ways, it's a closed system in which one can function to the best of his ability. And then there's reality, both in college and outside. And the interesting thing about this conflict, as I see it, is that the college student is in a stage of his life when he is most idealistic. And the acceptance of reality is a very difficult thing. All of these cultural influences, the dependency, the rapid change, the generation gaps, or the military service, the idealism as examples, are going to relate to the educational goals of your child. He's going to need more and more knowledge and equipment to survive in our world. And I feel that this type of influence is going to put tremendous pressure on him to achieve as best he can and within his own bounds. Let me then give you some impressions of adolescence. Try to summarize some of this. And here I suppose I'm speaking now from three years and some more in working almost daily with what I would call the older adolescent. Probably top on my list is this business of being highly idealistic. They have concepts, they have new ideas, they want to try them out, and they're also very humanistic and very oriented towards other people and helping them. Secondly, they have developed really in a relatively uh, short time ago their full intellectual capacity and for the first time are more than willing to use it, as you probably so well know. And they're going to use it with their idealism, they're going to use it in their orientation to people, and they're going to use it in their opposition to their parents and their breaking away from home. And I think this relates, the last statement, to a very important concept. They want to be independent. If there's anything that research shows on the college student is they're striving constantly for their independence and their own self-determination. In this independence, 
they're also turning for support away from the family and more strongly towards their peers. Developmentally, the peers are becoming the most important factor in their life. And once they leave the peer group, it's to form their own families and to develop their own homes and to move into that concept. But there's a very necessary period for them around their own kind, their own fellow students, and away from the family. Another thing I think that I have as a distinct impression of the adolescent and the college student is they really do want to be responsible to and for themselves. And if there's anything that is going to help them succeed in the adult world, it's going to be responsibility for themselves. A last impression that I would like to share especially with you as parents is that they are basically not much different from their parents. Now, you may find this hard to believe at times uh, when they come home from college. He comes in the door with long hair and a beard and dirty clothes, etc. I didn't wear my dirty clothes this afternoon. And you wonder, is that what I sent off and I'm paying $3,000 a year to educate? But basically, if you have given to him your values and your experience and your concerns, scratch the surface and you're still going to find yourselves there. What you believe. And I could cite a study here that was done on some people after they left college. And they compared the students and their parents on their religious beliefs, political beliefs, economic goals, etc. And the correlation is much higher between parents and their students than I think either of you would like to believe sometimes. But they are not that much different from you while they're in college or when they leave. Now, let me reflect on some impressions of parents. I suppose it could be best summed in this phrase, I want the best for my child. From that, I would transpose into the idea that they are probably the most well-intentioned people in the world. They want the best. I have yet to deal, even among some of the most severe difficulties I have seen in college students, with a parent whose intentions for his child were not the best. Maybe sometimes they're terribly misguided in what they want. Maybe they're too pushy. Maybe they won't let him have his independence. Maybe they can't untie the apron strings but parents still want the best and are basically very well intentioned. Secondly, they're also the best models for adult life that the adolescent has. If he wants to look around him and look at adults and see what adults do and how they function and how they act in the world, the most obvious thing to do is to look across the breakfast table or the dinner table or the TV across it and look at his mother and father and look at the best models he has. And I would keep that in mind because you will be getting a more and more severely critical eye in the next four years. Thirdly, I would say this. Parents frequently are too pessimistic and too untrusting of their own kids. After spending 18 years investing yourselves and your values and your beliefs into them, you then have very little confidence in what you did. And so you come away with a pessimistic, somewhat untrusting, 
somewhat turned off view of your own child. I think it's because you've got a lot invested in him, very obviously. Sometimes I think there are parents who have too much invested in their children. This probably relates to a couple of things. One, I think when parents become pessimistic and untrusting of their children, they're probably too concerned about the image of themselves that's being projected through their kids. They're saying, what will Mr. and Mrs. Jones think when Johnny comes home looking the way he does? Or what will happen when Johnny comes home and he's flunked out of college? And they're not thinking about it for Johnny. They're thinking about it for themselves too frequently. And I would like you to keep that in mind in the next four years. Secondly, they're probably too concerned about outward appearances. And I say this with kind of a smile because every once in a while I get a very severe look because of my outward appearances. I do wear suits and ties, however. But parents can come to me with some of the oddest complaints about the way the student is dressed, his hair, his beard, his lack of beard, his too short hair, his too long hair, the same goes for girls. I don't like the glasses. I don't like the clothes she's wearing. Isn't it terrible? And I probably could say at times I can sympathize. Some of it is outlandish. Some of it is terrible. It's also the thing to do right now. And it's the mod dress, etc. And again, scratch the surface and look at the 18 years you put into the person and don't worry so much about outward appearances. I could give you a quote from Dr. Carl Krislak's research on the history of Augsburg this last year. In there is some material, and he came across this, about how to go about selecting professors for Augsburg College back in the 1890s. And one of the statements is run something like this. Beware of the clean-shaven, short-haired young men. They're the radicals. And if you want a good, qualified man, get a long-haired, bearded, rather older, conservative individual. And sometimes this points out the ridiculousness of our concern about the externals and the outward appearance. Another reason, and probably the last one I'll mention, as to why parents get rather pessimistic about adolescence is I think they can't remember their own adolescence. And what they do remember is probably only the good things about it. But I'll bet you there isn't a person in this room who as an adolescent didn't do something that his parents violently disagreed with or that could have gotten them into trouble with the law in some form or another. And I don't mean accidentally, I mean deliberately. And keep in mind that you had a difficult period of finding yourself as adolescents and keep in mind that your students will and keep in mind that you all turned out pretty well. And I have a feeling that your students will, too. Now, I think I can summarize all of this into something that I would like to call identity. Now, this is a term that gets thrown around, and it's something I think the psychologists invented, and some of us wish that the term had never been invented because of all the garbage that gets written about it. But I think I could simply define identity as this way. All of the material I've discussed with you, the tasks, the pressures, the impressions, the development of the person, centers around choosing one's identity. In a sense, 
taking on certain identifying marks that will be him or her when they go out into the adult world. I think this is the major goal of any person. Who are you? What's your name? What do you look like? What's your job? Who are you married to? How many kids do you have? What's your college education? Simply bringing all these together, a person goes through all of the struggle to come up with something called his identity. The student's identity and your student's identity will never fit what you deem best for him. There are too many other influences now in his life and in the past 18 years that compete with yours that will never leave you with the total satisfaction that he came out with the identifying marks that you wanted exactly. He or she will turn out to be different from everyone else and very likely somewhat different from what you expected. And it's my feeling as a psychologist that that's their right to be what they were meant to be in spite of parents or teachers or pastors or friends. They're going to somehow be a unique individual. And I would like to close just on another note of optimism. Last year at the beginning of our faculty workshop, then Bishop James Shannon spoke to us and spoke very optimistically about the younger generation and what they have to do in order for the world to survive and what he thinks they are capable of doing in order for us to survive. And I would just like to say that I share Bishop Shannon's optimism about young people 100%. And I would like to stress to you as parents to have optimism about your young people. And in one sense, to have faith in them, even as for the past 18 or so years, they have had faith in you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Holman. I hope that this has provided some good background that we can now use as we move into our discussion groups. I want to make one brief announcement before we break for our discussion groups. You're aware of the parents' buffet at 6.30. I want to remind you again that admission will be by ticket only. And if you haven't had a chance to secure your tickets yet, I think they're still on sale in the College Center.